I think that the happiest person in the world is a content person. And I wasn't content. And you're going to find yourself depressed because you, you're you not content. You can't find contentment. You're chasing, 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 chasing. And then you get it and you're like, that wasn't enough. Hi everyone, I'm Rosemary Miller and welcome to Then They Rose. Here we'll be exploring the inspiring journeys of how celebrities, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders overcame adversity and rose to greatness. Today we have the honor of speaking with Lecrae Devon Moore, better known as Lecrae. He's not only a prominent Christian hip-hop artist, songwriter, and record producer, but also the co-founder of Reach Records. Lecrae's journey is marked by several critically acclaimed albums, including the Grammy Award-winning Gravity. His music tackles social issues, faith, and personal struggles, reflecting his own experiences growing up in a broken home and overcoming substance abuse and legal troubles. Despite facing criticism from both mainstream and Christian audiences, Lecrae remains steadfast in his mission to inspire and empower through his unique blend of hip-hop and faith-based lyrics. Join us as we delve into his journey, his music, and his impact on the industry and beyond. Lecrae? That's right. Thank you for joining Then They Rose. Absolutely. Glad to be here. So how are you today? I'm feeling all right. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm in I'm in uh, L.A. Can't complain. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, on this show, we're here to talk about how people have overcome adversity to achieve greatness, and I can't think of a better person to oh, talk wow. to about that than you. Wow, that's big. <laughs> I appreciate that. I guess I have been through some things. You have. Yes. So take us back. Tell us about Young Lecrae. What was life like? Young me. Um, young me, you know, I, I, I was, I grew up without my dad in the house. Um, my mom was a very strong woman cause she comes from a lineage of just women who are very strong. They may not be like emotionally present, but they're very, they're, they're, they want the best for you. So I was always looking for ab affirmation looking for someone to like affirm me um, because I wasn't really, you know, getting that. I, I would get the, here's what you should do, here's what you shouldn't do, you did a good job. I would get congratulated for accomplishing things. Yeah. But I don't know if I felt like people were just appreciating me for me. I was a performer, so I performed all the time. You mm -hmm. know, performed at the talent shows, performed at the cafeteria, performed for the girls, performed just everywhere, just performing. Um, but you know, it was it was probably a lot of dark things going on. But I don't think I I processed them. You don't really process them when you're a kid. Yeah. Yeah. And you said, okay, you come from strong women. Mm -hmm. Your dad wasn't really in the picture. Yep. Was there any male figure in the picture? Yeah, the male figures for me were my uncles, who I loved. Now they were. <laughs> These, these, they, they were trying to, what's the best way? How can I put this? I mean, they were trying to figure things out the best they could. They would say they made their, their mistakes as well. Um, mm -hmm. my, my favorite uncle that I looked up to the most was the one that spent the most time with me was my uncle Chris, who was very much involved in gangs. You know, he was in the streets. So I wanted to be in the streets. Uh, that's what I thought. Um, being a man was, was being like him. And he was only 10 years older than me. But that was enough. You know, when you're 10 and someone's 20, that, that's all the man, you know, you think you need. So uh, my mom had boyfriends, um, you know, and some of her relationships were pretty toxic. Yeah. And so that toxicness flow overflowed to me. But no one that I just connected with in a healthy way. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So take us to the point where you started feeling a shift. Like, OK, things have to turn around. Things are out of control for me. Um, in, in my life, I think, um, so when you look at my life, there's this kid who's trying to figure himself out, trying to be like his uncle, uh, thinks he has to go to prison to be a man, thinks, you know, is not really thinking about the future that much, um, but just trying to figure out how to become tougher, right? 
And um, then I found out, I think probably high school. I think high school is when I was like, oh, girls like me, you know? So I was like, oh, well, let me lean into that a little bit more. But then that, I, I didn't really know how to interact in a healthy way with women. So because of that, I think I started spiraling in that area. So now it's, you know, drugs, alcohol, women, trying to figure out what it means to be a man. And I think it was just overwhelming for me, right? Mm -hmm. So um, once it got to be so overwhelming, um, my mom really stepped in and was like, you needed some, some to... We need to be more intentional. And that intentionality led me to play basketball. Basketball saved my life, right? Mm -hmm. So playing basketball gave me structure. And I think that's the point where the breaking point, I was at wit's end, but then started playing basketball in high school. And I felt like I have a reason to move forward. It wasn't perfect, but it started, that's when the unraveling kind of got bad and yeah closed in. I'm trying to give a, a, a quick version of it, mm -hmm. but let me just say this. Basketball was the beginning of me understanding structure and that like life is worth living. Um, when I graduated and basketball was not in the picture, I think then I spiraled again. And that's when it got ugly. So I want to go back a little bit. Yeah. Tell me about your mother. What, what was she like? She, I'm sure she saw you go through all of these changes in your childhood. Yeah. How does she handle that? Yeah, it's a book uh, by Oprah and her therapist called What Happened to You. And so a lot of times we say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> but the real question is, what happened to you? Right. So my mom, she was very intense, very intense, very militant. She grew up with the Black Panthers. She grew up without her father. She grew up for a season without her mother. Her mother sent her to stay with her aunt. So she was raised by her aunt and she wrestled with why does my mom want me? Why does my dad want me? So she had a lot of internal things going on with her that made her very intense. And um, because of that, you know, when I would spiral out of control, she only knew how to, you know, deal with it with intensity. What do you mean by intensity? Basically like you know, work harder, get yourself together, figure your stuff out. This ain't going to work here. There wasn't a lot of like, well, what's going on with you? Like, what, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? Because she didn't grow up with that. So yeah. she didn't know to give that because she didn't experience that. So she, she's watching me and she's just kind of like, you need to get it together. Yeah. You know, um, and she, you know, she did the best she could. I'm sure she did. Yeah, did the best she could. But I'm sure there were a lot of kids probably going through the same thing you were going through. So in her mind, do you think he's just another one? Yeah, that was her biggest thing. She was like, I just got to keep you out of jail. That was it. That was her thing. Like, get an education and stay out of jail. Like, if she can keep me out of jail, she'd do a good job. But, I mean, to, to be fair, that's the route of a lot of guys in my family is a lot of guys went through the system in some kind of way. You know, addictions, prison, jail... Like, there's not a, there's no doctors or lawyers or, you know, entrepreneurs as far as the men in my family to look toward. So, it's military was the highest honor. So, if you can make it to the military, you did it. And, uh, you know, other than that, yeah, you just kind of like, uh, just keep them out of jail. So, what do you have to say to the young boys out there whose only goal is to stay out of jail right <laughs> now? Oh, man, you can, you can do way more than that. You know, like when I look at my life, I see that um, I didn't recognize my potential. I didn't recognize the God-given gifts that I had. I didn't recognize, you know, the abilities that were within me. Um, and I think because no one was able to, to say those things or impart those things. Now, this is what I do got to give my mom credit for. What she didn't know, she listened. And there were teachers who said, I think he might be gifted. And so... They, she she would listen to their recommendations and yeah. they would tell her, put me in this program or do this or do that. She would listen. So I would just say that. I would say there's more to you than meets the eye. And, you know, a lot of times young boys can only be what they've seen, can only become what they've beheld. So if they haven't seen it, they don't know what they can be. So I would just say, man, there's more out there for you and, and exposure is a big thing. You know, you, you 
got to expose them. And if you're a leader or parent or somebody expose those kids to something, you just never know what that does. I go and visit a school in, um, on the west side of Atlanta that I helped uh, start called Peace Preparatory Academy. And these are kids in some of the roughest area in the city. And, you know, you would think, like, I have to do so much to get them to change. But sometimes it's just bringing them lunch and just showing up. And they're like, a Grammy Award winner came and ate with me and brought me lunch and talked with me. I might, I matter. You know what I mean? And, and maybe I can, too, do these types of things that, that he's done. Did you feel like that growing up, that you didn't matter? For sure. I felt like I didn't matter unless I did something great. Yeah. Which is, I think a lot of celebrities and entrepreneurs, business people, I think they wrestle with an internal insecurity of mm-hmm. like, like I got to prove myself. I got I, I to gotta become something more because they don't know they have a God-given identity. They don't realize they were purposeful when they came out the womb. You know, your purpose is received. It's not achieved, right? So I don't have to achieve purpose. I was given it by God. I just need to, like, operate in it. So I felt like that a lot as a kid because a lot of times you reinforce that mindset by congratulating. We do it all the time. We congratulate our kids when they do a good job. Mm -hmm. Instead, we should congratulate them for the hard work, Yeah. right? It's like, oh, you did a good job. You got an A. So that tells them if they don't get an A, then they're they're not great. Instead of saying, man, I saw you working so hard. I'm proud of how hard you worked. Well, that teaches them to work hard because sometimes they're going to work hard and they'll get an A. Sometimes they won't. <laughs> All right. So basketball is yeah. out of the picture and you start spiraling again. Yeah. Basketball is out of the picture. Um, how candid can I be? Can I be candid? Be candid. Okay, be <laughs> candid. Basketball is out of the picture. And I just... You know, felt like what's the point? I just was like, let's be a let's be living total hedonistic existence. You know what I mean? So it's like, what do you want to do? Do you want to snort cocaine? Let's do it. Why not? You know, you want to uh, meet some girl at the theme park and sleep with her tonight? Do it. You know, you want to get drunk and get high and Go steal a bunch of clothes from the mall. Just do it. And so for me, that's that's kind of what my mindset was at that time. It was just part of it. I feel like was ADHD. Yeah. You know, impulsiveness. But the other part was just like, I don't know where this road leads, and it's fun. I, I wasn't thinking of consequences. I just wanted to have fun. And so um, I think the fun came with consequences that I didn't realize. And you hit that wall. And you're empty inside. It's like you, you never find a person who says, man, I ate dinner tonight. I don't ever need to eat again. Mm-hmm. Right. You eat a meal. You need another one and another one, another one. And it's the same with, you know, sex or drugs or name it. It, it. There's no end to that. So if you're thinking you'll find fulfillment, you're not. I was looking for satisfaction and I was just being gratified and I wasn't being satisfied. So. I hit a brick wall and it was like, I'm spiraling out of control at this point in time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you said a lot of things, right? Sex, alcohol. Mm-hmm. How about success? Success. Um, that's interesting that you mentioned that. I was able to mask a lot of my shortcomings and a lot of my my addictions and, and, and trials and, and trauma through success. Hmm. So initially, you know, it's how you, it's, it's whatever you, you deem as success. So initially it was like, did I make varsity? I made varsity, right? Success, right? Um, then it, did I get a full scholarship? I got a full ride, right? Success. Um, did I get the girl that I wanted? I got her success. Um, and, and so I was able to hit all these benchmarks consistently, which made me, you know, it's like you're chasing gratification. I was just thinking about, you just said, so you asked me something and it, it made me think about something else. I was asking, oh, that's what it was. I was, I was at the BET Awards and I was like, man, I need to, uh, I need to 
to be on stage. I never got to um, perform or or do anything at an award show. Mm -hmm. And then my guy Flex was like, no, didn't you do, um, I forgot what award show that was. Was it BET Awards? Yeah, yeah. Didn't you do the, you did the BET Hip Hop Awards. You did a performance there. And I was like, oh yeah. And what it let me remind me of was, dang, it doesn't gratify. I mean, it doesn't satisfy. Like, yeah. I did something and I'm like, no, nah, I got to do that thing. In the back of my mind, I know it's not going to scratch the itch, but you still keep chasing it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're still struggling with that to this day. All the time. It's not going to go away. You just got to, it's just like a lion. You just got to learn how to tame it. You yeah. can't kill it. You're not going to kill it till you die. Mm -hmm. It's a part of you. You can tame it, but you're not going to kill it. So I just, I just do a better job at taming that beast. So before you got it tamed, take us back. You're, you're doing it all right now. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm not realizing that the beast needs to be tamed. So yeah. initially, so I'm, you know, I'm chasing my dreams and I get out of school. I was always a backup plan type of person. So, um, I get out of school and, you know, I learned a different world. I learned the world of you know, corporate America and business. I learned that this world exists, a world that I wasn't privy to before. So I'm like, okay, this world exists. I've gone through college. I get this internship and I'm like, yeah, I want to be successful over here. And now I'm making all this money at this internship and I'm going right back to my excessive lifestyle, doing too much. Um, and then I, you know, I'm just kind of, going through these motions and I think what ultimately happened was I had a spiritual transformation right mm -hmm. and during my spiritual transformation I realized man God made me for more than just chasing after the proverbial ladder of success yeah at least I thought I realized that before we get to the spiritual transformation yeah I want to know how do you feel that being a black man yeah. played a role in the drugs the oh. sex, the thinking, all of those things were cool, the stealing. Yeah. Well, I think um, I think black men specifically yeah. have a very um, insufficient picture of what it means to be a man in society, right? Um I think when you start behind um, the eight ball, so to speak, you, you already are behind economically, educationally. You just find other means to celebrate yourself, right? Mm -hmm. If I know I'll never be a Harvard MBA candidate or I'll never be Jeff Bezos or I'll, ne not, I'll never be a doctor, I didn't even know black people, black men could be doctors, first of all. This is a tr true thing. Like, I would have been in my 20s before I conceived the idea that we could be lawyers and doctors. So when you have that mindset, you just find new things to champion. Well, let me be the toughest. Well, let me sleep with the most women. Well, let me, you know, you just climb smaller ladders that you find are accessible. Mm -hmm. And different heroes that are achievable. So, you know, if I can't be a doctor because number one, you know, uh, the, the structures that exist don't give me that opportunity. Well, I can be the biggest drug dealer in the neighborhood. Yeah. I can achieve that. So those are some of the things that you start to, to process and chase after, you know, that, that makes me think of this book called black rage. Mm. And in the book, I don't want to misquote it. So don't yeah. quote me. They mention how black men out in the world, they know they can't be the most powerful mm -hmm. just because, you know, you're black. That's right. You For your safety, you That's can't right. be the most powerful. Yeah. So black men go out of their way to be the best in the bedroom. I, I agree. Yeah. I totally would agree. The best in the bedroom, the best in the back alley, the best. At, if you can't be good at being good, you'd be good at being bad. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah, it's what it comes down to. So, you know, that becomes the the thought process. Okay. Yeah. So, the spiritual transformation. Yeah, the spiritual transformation was good for me in the sense that 
um, you know, I, I don't think I thought I had purpose or worth and, um, and that, and that transformation where, you know, where I am like, oh, I have this encounter with the Lord and I'm like, I need, I want to be different. I don't want to keep going down the same path. Um, and I tried a lot of religions. I've, I've studied world religions. I've studied tons of things. Yeah. I think, you know, I didn't want to mess with Christianity only because it was my grandmother's and I just felt like her and I are worlds apart. So there's mm -hmm. no, I'm not messing with that. That's, that's old. It's antiquated. How old were you? Me? Yeah. 44. At that time. Oh, I'm like, at the time, uh, 19. 19, okay. Yeah. 19. And, and you had studied all of these different religions at 19. Because I was hungry. Well, you got to remember, too, I grew up with a very, a mother who was adamant about education, about me having knowledge. So, yeah. you know, the Black Panthers raised her. So she's like, hey, read this book, Soul on Ice, Eldridge Cleaver. Read this book, The Soul of Black Folk, W.B. Du Bois. Read this book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X. Like, I'm having to read this at 12, 13 years old. So... It's shaping my mind in ways that I didn't even realize. Right. But that's what she had me doing. She, you know, we're going to watch Roots. We're going to talk about, you know, she was very intentional about so, all these things. Even back then, you were already set apart because I'm telling you, everybody's not doing that in their household. Right. No, for sure. My mother was, because she went to this, this, this the Black Panthers fed her breakfast in the mornings at this, at this place in Third Ward, Houston called the Shape Center, which is still there today. Yeah. And the Shape Center is where they take these kids and the projects and in the hood and they just, you know, they feed them and they teach them th their self-worth. They teach them the value of education. So that was drilled in her brain as a child to where she becomes an adult and an advocate for the same mindset. And mm -hmm. that's why she drilled it in my brain. So I've always had a strong value for education and a strong value for, you know, knowing who I was in society. Um, I just hadn't married that with religion yet. I did. I was like, I don't know what. So, because I grew up the way I grew up, I, yeah. I went to the Nation of Islam first, okay. right? So, in high school, I started studying. My, my guy, Jamin, was practicing the Nation of Islam. So, I, all right, Jamin, I'm going to rock with you. And I, I just couldn't keep up. It was, I was just like, I like, I like pepperoni, and I like girls. I like women. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, <laughs> this is this tough. I don't think I can do this. Uh -huh. um, and so then, you know, I went to Baha'i faith because my grandmother went, you know, she had tried that before. And then I Rastafarianism because I like to smoke. So I was like, oh, okay, I, let me try this out. And which is kind of built on some biblical stuff as well. And then um, what I kept finding, even Buddhism and Hinduism, I was digging. What I kept finding was that all of these religions in some shape or form were me trying to better myself to reach nirvana or enlightenment or reincarnation or something but it was me having to work whether yeah. meditate or empty myself and it was so much work and then i said hold up grandma's faith is not about me working to earn favor with god it's about me surrendering and saying i can't you got to reach down and pull me up and I was like, oh, that's it. And that's when the light bulb went off for me. And so I was like, dang, grandma didn't know a lot, <laughs> you know, but yeah. that old time religion was right on time for me. And you're going through all of this at 19, 19 years old. 19. Processing. So in that, those emptying out phases, first of all, how did you, how did you stay steady with it? That's what I know I struggle with to this day in Christianity. Yeah. Just being consistent. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a process. <laughs> but I've always been an extremist. Okay. So moderation has never been my gift. Uh, when, I was, when I was out there, when I was outside, I was outside. If I'm drinking, I'm drinking. If I'm smoking, I'm smoking. Um, so it was like, if I'm serious about my faith, I'm very serious. Would you coin yourself an addict? Yes. Absolutely. So you see the pros and the cons of Absolutely. being an addict. Tell us, how has being an addict benefited you? Uh, an addict is a person who is... Uh, 
it's like a hyper focus. It's like a, a vigilance of getting your fix. It's like you are fixated on what it is that you want. And the way that that's helped me is I become fixated on goals. Yeah. And so I will, if I can have healthy habits and healthy addictions, they work well for me. Right. So, um, I, I binge. It's like when I'm serious about working out, I'm, I'm serious. I'm a binge gym rat. I'm in there. Mm -hmm. If I'm, you know, I don't know, skincare, I'm binging. I'm in there. I'm mm -hmm. on it. So, um, but that's, you know, I've learned over the years to, I, I I'm better right. than I used to be, but I'm still like, like today, you know, I, I was like, ah, I can't just get a cookie. I got to get a tray of them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, all right, I got to reel this in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you figure out grandma's religion. Uh-huh. That's, that may just be the one. That's the one. All right. Yeah. What happens? After that, um, you know, the, you go through that phase where everybody goes through. Yeah. That phase when you find this new outlook on life and you are just like all in. You're zealous. You got to tell the world, tell everybody. So I'm like, I don't do this no more. I'm changed. I don't do this. I don't do that. And that was a good thing for me at the time because it was so obnoxious and off-putting to my friends mm -hmm. that they they didn't invite me to the things that would have been detrimental for me. You know what I mean? Like I'm like in hindsight, I was very obnoxious. I was very off-putting. I wish I wasn't. But on the flip side, it was that's probably what kept me out of trouble, kept me out of jail. Yeah. Because I didn't all of my friends, not all, most of my close friends and relatives ended up in prison. You know, even uh, one of my closest friends who ended up going to school with me in college, he ended up doing three years in prison. So yeah. I, I just think that had I not been so vigilant about that, I don't think the outcome would have been good. So were you right there with them? Were you in the same hometown with your family, with your friend? You were right there yeah. and you pulled yourself out yep. right there. I mean, I pulled myself out in a sense. I wasn't trying to. I was just saying I can't. Yeah. I, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. Like, it was like, you're not doing none of it. I'm like, nothing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, nah. And so it was like, I'm not going out with y'all tonight. I'm not going to the club. I'm not, you know, going to this, going to this. And now, that lasted for three strong years. Yeah. Right? And then I fell off. I fell off the wagon, you know. And when I fell off, I fell off hard. So the fall off was... You know, that was kind of, that became the consistency. It was like, okay, I, I, I'm really strong for a good period of time, then I fall off. Then I'm really strong for a good period of time, then I fall off. Mm -hmm. And the good news is the stretch of me not falling off got longer and longer, but the consequences of the fall offs got weightier and weightier. What because, do you mean? well, because look at it like this like when you're 10 years old, and you're disobedient, you know, if I throw a rock at a car at 10 years old, um, you know, the consequences are not as heavy as me throwing a rock at a car at 20 years old. Right. Right. So if I, if I'm married with kids and I go on a binge drinking fest and end mm -hmm. up in a brothel, Mm -hmm. the consequences are heavier than if I'm single and I go on a binge drinking fest and end up in a brothel, right? It's like the consequences become weightier. So so the fall off, it was that big of a fall off. Well, I wasn't in a brothel. Okay. So <laughs> nah, I'm just using that as an example. Okay. Nah, but, but, but um, like for instance, I'll say this, like um, I was doing a men's program you know, it was a program, a pastor said, I'm going to teach y'all the whole Bible over a period of time. Here's the rules. You know, don't do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And, uh, and I was pretty consistent. It was a one-year program. And a few months in, um, my cousin has a probate as in his fraternity. I drive down to his probate to support him. I'm in a fraternity as well. And I'm like, man, one drink turns to seven. <laughs> and... Seven drinks turned, so I woke up on the couch with some girl. 
And mm-hmm. then I'm like, dang. And now I'm all busted up inside. And then I'm like, yo, I want to be transparent with the with the guys around me. And I was transparent. It's like, yeah, you can't finish the program. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Because that was part of the rules of the program. And so I was like, it's cool. So, you know, it was like, that's a consequence. It's a consequence. But, you know, that also speaks volumes. The fact that you felt something after you did it. Because once upon yeah. a time, you woke up and you were good. That's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, yes. <laughs> and, and and that's what I'm saying. You learn. You live and you learn. And you try to make better decisions as you. But, you know, sometimes you need those consequences to help you say, okay, I don't need to do that again. Right. I need not do that again. That was a bad idea. That was a bad yeah. idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when did you realize, like, okay, I got to be all in on this all the time? At what age did you realize that that was important? How old am I today? I think I learned that today. today and then I figured this out. Uh, I, I just, I never want to come off like, like I have it all together. Yeah. I want to come off like I'm a work in progress. Not as an excuse mm-hmm. to drop the ball, but more so as a an, a reality check that I'm human. Yeah. And in my humanity, you know, um, I understand that we fall, we fail. That's not the desire. So because I know, I just, I'm, I'm more aware of the darkness and the the, the stuff within me. I'm more mm-hmm. aware of it. So it's not a, a situation where I'm great now. I don't do any of the things I used to do. Yeah. It's I'm aware now. You know, if you are a heroin addict, you don't say, I'm no longer a heroin addict. You're like, nah, I know I'm an addict. And yeah. if I try that, I'm going to end up on skid row. Like, it's going to be bad. So for me, it's like, I know what I can be. So I put things around me to keep me from moving in those directions. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, give us even more detailed action items. You put things around you. Like, what are you doing to stay on the narrow path? On the narrow path. Uh I mean, I think one thing is, you know, some of it is just practical. Um, Like, I don't drink anymore. Okay. Right? And, And for me, it's practical because, you know, the times I have drank, it wasn't one. It's like, why can't I just have one drink? That's crazy. I can't have one. It always turns into seven. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And seven drinks turns into me, uh, uh, you know, talking crazy to somebody outside. And I don't, I'm like, why am I doing, what, what is happening right now? You know what I mean? Um, so that's, that's something simple. Another thing is being known. I think a lot of men are afraid to be known, like fully known. And this isn't even a spiritual thing. It is, but it's it's practical too. Yeah. Like I have friends that know me. They they know how much money I make. They know my taxes. They know my deepest darkest struggles. They know where, like, you know, I got friends who who've hit me up since I'm out here in L.A. Like, hey, what's up, man? How are you doing with your desire to want to be the best or the greatest? How are you doing with? The, the internal struggles that you usually have. How mm-hmm. are you doing with competition or whatever the, the, the thing may be at the time? It's just putting people in my life that know me and then I can be honest with them and say, this is my struggle, man. I'm wrestling with this. And they can give me genuine insight. But men are lonely. We don't talk. We don't, we really don't develop deep friendships. Women, y'all get together. Y'all like, girl, so what's going on with you, girl? How are you doing? <laughs> How, so tell me about the new guy. <laughs> like, that's what y'all do. We don't do that. Men get together and be like, what's up, bro? What's up, bro? Yeah, man, what's been going on with you? Just chilling, man. Trying to figure this out, boy. Marriage, boy. I know, bro. Marriage crazy. <laughs> and it's like, that's just, 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 that's what... It, or we do stuff side by side. We'll play yeah. basketball together. or we'll. But, you know, we don't just get together to talk. It's like... We got to be barbecuing or bourbon tasting or something to, yeah. to like get us in the same room to like begin to share. So I just try to be intentional. So you being that friend, does that open them up to being that kind of friend back? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You got to create that environment. So we, we cultivated it. We cultivated mm-hmm. it and we created it. And and somebody's got to lead out and being vulnerable. 
you yeah. know, somebody has to do it. So I'm like, well, all right, well, why not me? You yeah. know, so I'll lead out and being vulnerable. And it, it, it helps create that air of vulnerability amongst other people. Look, Ray, I, I was doing some research on you. Uh-oh. And there was a point where you said you had it all. Yeah. You had everything. Yeah. And yet you were still depressed. That's right. Yeah. Tell me about that. Um, I mean, shoot, where do we start? I mean, you know, I have won a couple Grammys, number one Billboard album in the country, number one album in the country, um, hit records, platinum songs. Um, and I think I just believed the lie. You know, I believed the lie that there was something at the top of that mountain, that there was a, a pot of gold that I could just bathe in and it would help me. Like, yes, I did it. Um, and you know, it happens to a lot of professional athletes once they win that championship, they're like, I thought this was the feeling I was chasing my whole life and then I got it and then it was gone, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that the happiest person in the world is a content person and I wasn't content and you're going to find yourself depressed because you you're not content you can't find contentment you're chasing 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 and then you get it and you're like that wasn't enough mm. i'm not i i want more so what was happening for me was i got the grammys i got the number one why doesn't kanye know my name he needs to know my name yeah. what do i do to make kanye know my name kanye knows my name why don't I have private jets? They got private jets. I need private jets. It you just doesn't stop. So how are you having this thought and then getting on your knees to pray in the same day? <laughs> well, you can manipulate yourself in the same way pastors, unhealthy ones, manipulate their congregations. So you can be your own worst enemy and manipulate yourself into thinking that, that this is somehow of God, mm-hmm. that this is somehow what God wants for you. Like you can... like. Because you want what you want. Like our desires become the, our God and God becomes a step stool to get the desire. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's like, oh, I need to pray because I want to be richer. <laughs> so I don't really want you, God. I just want you to make me richer. You know what I mean? So it became that type of relationship with myself where I was... I was the loudest voice in my own head Mm -hmm. and there were no voices that I was allowing to push back on my thoughts. And that's a very dangerous place to be. When you are the main voice you're listening to, I think you're in trouble. Yeah. You know, that's how why people are getting weird. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, you're weird. You never seen a person on a desert Island by themselves for years, come back like healthy and normal. (laughs) That's not the way that works. (laughs) So who are some of your mentors? Um, one of my longtime mentors is a guy named Roy Soup Campbell. He's a very down to earth, humble guy from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and, you know, a brilliant mind, but just down to earth, super humble. And I love that because he taught me, he taught me to travel the world. He taught me to be grassroots, hands on. And um, he's just an everyday guy. And mm-hmm. I think I needed him. I have, um, you know, other guys around me. I, you know, they're kind of like coaches, so to speak, uh, that I really admired and look up to. Um, some from afar, you know, from afar was, I would say, like a spiritual genius. Yeah. Uh, you know, is my brother Eric Mason, who just... I could ask him questions and he just has a depth of insight on different things. Um, and then uh, I, I, I think on uh, in terms of just like the wherewithal of like knowing how to navigate life, um, I've just been piecemealing, you know, finding a person here and here's a person here. I, I think I don't I don't think it's one mentor. I think you gotta have a series of them. Yeah. You know, who are experts in different areas. Kinda like that dinner we had a few weeks ago. 
that's we're true. learning. <laughs> You're that's learning true. from all of us. I was, and it was great because <laughs> to me, I'm I just stay curious. Yeah. I never want to feel like I know it all. I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I don't want to be the most knowledgeable person in the room. I want to be able to learn. I want to be able to grow. I want to be able to expand. And I also, I think because I learned how important it was to be affirmed and to know like, hey, you're dope. Not because of what you do. You're dope. Not because of how successful you are. You're dope. Like, here's what's dope about you. Here's what's great. I like, I want other people to know that. I feel I have a personal vendetta that I want people to know they're, they're dope. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So it's like, I'm burdened by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I told you you were good at that. You're good I, at making people feel good. Like I just, because I think, I think we don't get to know that that much. You yeah. know, we live in a noisy world where everyone's telling you what you can't do or showing you what you don't have. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't realize like, the magic we do have we don't realize our unique contribution or our unique gifting and i'm like i want people to see it you know here if i can't do anything else for you if i never see you again at least you can get a snap of that yeah you know what i mean well look i know you're always speaking about how you want to be known as more than just the gospel rapper guy like sure. you're more than that for sure what I, else do you want to be known for um it's changed from season to season. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be an elder statesman in the hip hop community, you know, just a voice. Um, I wanted to be seen as a culture maker, somebody who understands the culture and can speak into it. Um, somebody who understands that, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not Warren Buffett. I'm not Jay Z. But I am an executive, and I I can show you how to, you know, treat people well, and do. I can treat you how to do good and do well, yeah. right? Treat people well, do financially well, at the same time. Um, and I, I want to help people in that capacity. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I guess. You know, I won't fully understand or comprehend the weight of my contribution to this world. But here's what I will say. It's good. I'm glad you asked me this. Here's what I will say. I think we undervalue the little things that we bring to the world. I think that, um, you know, we put such a huge price tag and huge, like, you're so important to the people who win the Nobel Peace Prizes and the people who have thousands of people tuning in to whatever it is they have going on. And we undervalue that volunteer worker at the Salvation Army. Yeah. Right? Who just is patient with the same person on a regular basis. We undervalue that teacher who worked on one kid all year. And had a breakthrough. Yeah. Right? And I, I think, I think we, we, it's like, hey, what do you want to be known for? I want to be known for the teacher that invested in Sally, <laughs> you know what I mean? And saw her flourish. Yeah. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And so I think that's great. You have a beautiful heart. Oh, wow. Thank you. I was, appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, leave Thank us. God. With, hey, <laughs> <laughs> leave us with uh, three pieces of advice for young men, 18 to 25, that you wish you had known yourself. Three pieces of advice that I wish I would have known. Um, one would be, if you live for people's acceptance, you'll die from their rejection. Um, just meaning that don't wear yourself out to live for the approval of others. Like, because they can reject you just as quickly and then you're crushed. Um, two, I would say, um, you know, look at the five people around you and you're looking at yourself. So you don't want to be the smartest person in your circle, 
You don't want to be the uh, hardest working person in your circle. You don't want to be the most inspiring person in your circle. You want there to be a race amongst you all. And you guys are constantly outpacing each other in those areas. Uh, I say that's another big piece of advice. And then lastly, yeah, stop listening to the inner monologues. You know what I mean? Just that inner inner speech that's telling you what you can't do, what you won't do, or that's telling you you're fine, everything's great. Like, you need people outside of yourself who love you to speak truth to you. And, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. Well, what's next for you, Lecrae? I don't know. I guess food. I'm hungry. You ain't hungry? I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I can yeah. eat. <laughs> <laughs> nah, food, man. Uh, but sincerely, what's next? Um, I think... Honestly, what's next for me is, is, you know, trying to find that lane. Obviously, the podcasting has been a, a great avenue for me to, to share that. I'm working on new music, so there'll be new music coming out from me um, and supporting my younger artists who are trying to get it going. Yeah, always yeah. reach back. That's right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. Appreciate you.